as I am delving deeper into what the future holds for all of us and how we must upskill for the coming world. I'm thrilled to have with us Anushree Bansal, who is currently a senior economist, Asia Pacific for MasterCard Economics Institute. She has got a master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences, followed by a research analyst position at the LSC, where she was coordinating several projects uh, under lots of research uh, professors. Then she went to Towers Watson, was a senior economist there, then went to SBI CAP in Mumbai and worked as an economist in institutional equities, and then spent time with ICICI Bank as a senior economist for three years and has been with MasterCard since. Uh, an erudite and resplendent career spanning almost 20 years across academia, consulting, and corporations. Um, I had the thrill of hearing Anushri uh, live at a conference, and I came away completely astounded by her uh, depth, uh, her detailing, and her communication skills. And obviously, as a woman leader in a leading position, I thought it would be imperative to have her opinions in the book and we've really tried hard to make this interview happen. So thank you, Anushri. I know you have a very busy life. Thank you for making time for this conversation. Uh, my pleasure, Vibha. Thank you for this opportunity. Looking forward to the interview and then reading your book, of course. All right, terrific. Okay, so Anushri, <laughs> as we you know started writing this book and started thinking about the future, we were like, why, why is it important to keep a pulse on the future? Why, why, is, why is this topic even important? Why think about what's coming in the future? In your, in your work, obviously you're predicting trends, you're thinking about the future. Why is it essential for people? So, you know, personally, my son is 10 years old. So he will be 26 in 2040 and he'll be a new entrant in the workforce. So it makes full sense for me to understand how I should equip him for the future so that he becomes successful. So that's a very, very personal uh, you know, choice. And given the changing trends, which have just leapfrogged because of the pandemic, we need to keep an eye on how to be adaptable, flexibility and willingness to learn should be there. Like these are some of the key things that come to my mind. So just, okay. if you're saying, you know, just from, a, if you have a young sort of a, a, a child or a sibling, hmm. sort of yeah. career planning and forecasting from their perspective, uh, mm -hmm. As an economist, why why do you why do economists predict future trends? Why is it important for economists to understand the future? You know, it it's not only for an economist; it is for everybody. We have to figure out how we will remain adaptable and flexible to have some sort of meaningness in our roles. And uh, the ch times are changing. Technology is the greatest enabler, and we have to keep that adaptation on. Okay. And we need to sort of focus, have that eye on the future, essentially. Okay, keep an eye on the future. So you know how things are going to change and basis how things are going to change, how we must adapt ourselves for the coming future. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, as, as, as we think yeah. about the mm -hmm. coming future, yeah. You you touched upon technology as something that's that's a a factor that's going to influence the future. What what are some of the other factors that you're seeing playing into future trends? Mm -hmm. You know what are influences of maybe of sustainability, climate, tech. Yeah. What all are you seeing mm -hmm. influencing our future? Yeah, yeah. So I think technological disruption that I spoke about is an important driver. Investment-led productivity gains could also shape the future of our work. So that is something that we will have to keep an eye on. Secondly, which a lot of people ignore and maybe just economists are thinking about it right now is demographics. We are seeing aging in a lot of the developed markets, be it Europe, be it Northeast Asia, uh, Japan, for example. In fact, like labor contribution to GDP would be a negative percentage point in Japan in 2040. So, and this is World Bank and UN data that I'm quoting. So there is this eye and this focus that we need to keep on the aging population and robotics and AI measures that increase productivity would be required to replace the shortage in the workforce. So I think that would be a second or a third more important aspect that we need to keep in mind. Climate change, as you mentioned. So extreme weather events 
have increased and these impact developing markets asymmetrically. Just navigating these terrains, being prepared for weather, vagaries, figuring out manufacturing to supply chains, all that would be important. Fourth, I think a lot of us, and these are you know tur turbulent times, we've been going through multiple series of wars across economies. So geopolitics plays a very, very big role. The, it, the economy, the global economy is becoming increasingly insular. There are these waves of nationalism that we are seeing across different markets in the world. So it would be very necessary to watch and multinational companies will have to, maybe will move away and give rise to homebown conglomerates. So that could also shape the future of work in my you know, perspective. Supply chains that are moving away from just in time to just in case with the pandemic and you know the dependence that we had on China being sort of diversified could see further disruptions as the world becomes more insular. And lastly, I think what I think could shape the future of work is human behavior. And we need to keep an eye on something which I which we call the behavioral econ economics. Consumers are becoming extremely choosy, impatient. They require immediate satisfaction. Lifestyles are changing. People are. So, this state of transition is likely to continue and probably solidify over the next 16 odd years if we're looking into 2040. So, I think the workplace will have to be mindful of these sort of changes and then work accordingly. Okay, wow. That's a, that's a very loaded uh, introduction. Uh, you've touched upon lots yeah. and lots of really uh, yeah. key, interesting points. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to play with these these points that you brought up and try to go deeper into them. Let Let's start mm -hmm. with what what you opened with technology and uh, the aging workforce and how AI can play uh, a, a positive role in countries where there's an aging population. Um, what happens? So you know, we, there's this juxtaposition of AI, right? Because the world is moving to like there are countries like India, which still have a young population, and then you have aging populations in Japan and some parts of Europe. So yes, mm -hmm. in economies, I can understand that technology will come in and sort of boost productivity. But what happens in countries where people are still looking out for jobs, and then you have displacement mm -hmm. of labor markets because of technology. So how, how do you see this sort of balance uh, shift, this balance, you know, and the shift panning out and what should policymakers and governments do in situations where now technology and AI is going to come in and take away jobs? From a developed market perspective and where the aging workforce is, is in place right now, I think, as I mentioned earlier, productivity led investment gains would be crucial. The other sort of policy shift that would be required would be on migration. You know, in fact, increase in migration flows or countries that are open to migration will see improvement in labor contribution to grow. So that is something that needs to be kept in mind. So, so now for a country, these aging the countries with aging populations should open up their borders and allow yeah. for, okay, okay, fine. More, more workforce, more productive workforce and sort of also just investing in that technology. So that has to go hand in hand for these uh, more developed aging societies. Now, for a country like India, I think, or like any emerging market, which is, has a young population, I think skill enable, enablement, like training would be the biggest driver to sustain these sort of shifts that we are seeing. Focus on analytical training. Like they, you have to develop policies where economies move from low skill manufacturing capabilities to niche skill technology equipped workers. So those sort of policies have to be in place. Reach of education and technology in the context of India to the rural hinterlands is very, very important. Uh, introducing more analytical content in our syllabuses, more facilities provided even to the poorest regions across the country would be of utmost importance. And this is if we were to plan for employability over the next 10 to 15 years. India right now creates 11 million jobs a year. So we need to have a work uh, like systems in place that absorb these new entrants to workforce. And what the factors that I mentioned earlier in terms of analytical training, reach of education and technology to the hinterlands will probably assist that. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, you know you're, you're suggesting obviously the government works on enabling skill enablement education and then trying to make sure that that sort of seeps through not just the cities but into rural areas because mm -hmm. that's where the bulk of the population at least exists today. Do you really see you know as Sam Altman put out a statement saying there will be no jobs in the future. Everything is going to be automated. Do you do you really think we're going to end up in a situation where there will be no jobs? I mean, it's it's it, what happens to economic theory when there are no jobs. So uh, is that a, is that a possibility? So I don't I don't uh, vouch for such an extreme thought process because we would need jobs and employ employed workforce to create that AI. Secondly, we need domain expertise. Like if you would. If you, let's say, an AI tool were to replace a doctor's job, that doctor, that sort of knowledge base of that doctor also needs to be there. So that domain expertise will be required. So jo jobs would definitely become more niche. I think they would probably be segmented. You would need creators of technology. So th those sort of jobs would definitely remain. And at the second end, you will need people who have that expertise to assist those who are creating that job. That knowledge, that domain expertise can only differentiate you from somebody who is just relying on AI and doing the work. So okay. I think I don't I don't believe that we will be in a in a future where there will be no jobs. Okay, okay. So you're saying it's an extreme stance and uh, you you are seeing sort of human beings still exist at the at the center of the decision making since since you touched upon your work um let let's 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 stay on you know the role of an economist um how are you seeing with with the advent of ai are you seeing any fundamental shifts uh, in how your role pans out uh, if not right now in the next couple of years are you seeing ai come into the workspace are you seeing a more technology come in and how are you seeing maybe not completely displaced but how are you seeing the role evolve yeah i think i think ai is bringing an a lot of uh, excitement to our workplace uh, economics is all about data uh, and data sort of trying to build a story around the data and given the tools and the development and technology it is it is becoming easier. It's becoming more exciting. We have more uh, bang for the buck, if I were to call it. Uh, we have tools in place which create a visual dream, as I had shown to you in that presentation. So that is all just thanks to technology and AI. So I think it's a great complement to the field of economics. Any anything you could uh, share more specifically, like uh, is there a way, is there a method or process that you did earlier that now you see has shifted or will shift in the next four or five years? So I started as a research assistant at the uh, LSC research labs and of course, it was extremely sophisticated. Technology was extremely sophisticated for that point in time where you were working on state accords and doing the econometric analysis. But a line of code or a, you know, which, which would take me hours to process will probably now take milliseconds. Mm. So that is a lot of productivity gains that we are seeing. The capabilities in terms of just the systems to run big data has really, really emerged successfully. Mm. So we have time gains, we have productivity gains, we have better analysis in place, and the final output is great. So I think in all these aspects, technology has been a great enabler uh, within the economics field. Okay, okay. So you're saying the processing speeds have, have increased rapidly and the accuracy of the models has also increased. And the way you're telling the story, right? At the end of it, all of us are marketers, all of us are storytellers. So the way we are telling it has improved because of the uh, compliments that technology is bringing to us. Okay, as, as in the, the data becomes easier to access, easier to explain, easier to visualize. The data, the quality of data has increased, our breadth of data coverage has increased, and then like the way we can visualize it and put it across has improved. So it's sort of just taking care of all the nodes there. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, are you are you seeing uh, any shifts in terms of the workspace? Uh, in terms of hiring, are you seeing a certain kind of hiring that's happening currently or will happen in the future compared to what you saw earlier in in larger organizations? 
So within economics and finance, of course, there is this pension to hire uh, people who have an analytics background now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people who really outshine are those who, who can understand both the economics and the data science. And those are the flag bearers for us right now at the moment, right? Because you can do the analytics and then you can sort of build the story and have the understanding that an economics ha economist has. So I think those sort of jobs are currently, or like people who have those skills are currently in demand. Those are what, like if I were to go out for hiring, I would look for both sets of uh, uh, skills, which was probably not the case 20 years ago when I started off, where we were just looking at economic skills. So I think that has definitely changed. Um, looking into the future, I think, of course, data analytics and AI specialists would continue to be in demand. I also think that what something that we haven't yet focused on, but we will probably do or we should is behavioral economics and psychology sure. in the field. You know, just understanding human behavior is extremely crucial in all decision making. Mm -hmm. And given that the consumer is ruling the roost, it was always, but now it has become extremely choosy. There is this, you know, need. So we would have to enhance that skill set within the economics field as well. I also think that the risk of cyber security and fraud has increased given that we're becoming increasingly digital. So experts in that field will be increasingly in demand. Mm -hmm. So people, regulatory compliance, risk management, those sort of fields, which will marry and complement well with the, with the economics would probably also then start being in demand. Okay. So yeah, and I think the world, because as I mentioned, it has become insular risk analysts like geopolitical risk analysts expertise in global markets who understand these sort of varying degrees of risks would all you know international business strategists as i would call them would okay. also probably be okay superb okay from 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 your lens it seems like there are plenty of jobs and plenty of requirements for people so i, I think you nailed a very 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 sort of very specific areas um yeah. that would and and they translate very well to what's coming so so that was beautifully explained since you talk, talked about consumer behavior and you know behavioral economics what and since you're a large part of your study is understanding consumers and consumer trends what is going on with the consumers what what sort of trends are you forecasting how are people shifting how are buying preferences shifting how is the consumer as we know it today shifting so, you know, the consumer is extremely fickle. Let me start with that. So if I were to tell you what the consumer is doing, it would be a very short-term forecast that I can give you. And uh, in that How perspective, short short? I think the short would be a year, two-year horizon right. is what I would be talking about. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I always get confused because e economists think long-term is 10. Everybody else thinks long-term is two to three years. So yeah, I just, yeah, it's good that I'll, I'll talk to you in the next two to three years. Yeah. yeah. So I think the pandemic has led to a lot of idiosyncratic behavioral shifts. Uh, this need, the, there was this, as soon as the economies opened up, there was this pent-up demand to do things that consumers were forced not to do during the pandemic. So this was spending on experiences, eating out, travel. And that has continued, and we've been seeing a lot of data around it, is that even today, which is around two or three years after the lifting of restrictions, experiences, people are spending more on experiences than things, apart from the Indian consumer, though. The Indian consumer, when they go abroad, they will still spend on luxury and jewelry. But the other part of the world is all spending more on experiences. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Chinese consumer who was erstwhile known to spend a lot on things which we would call retail is now increasingly, if they have a chance of going out, are spending on experiences. So that is one behavioral shift but that we have seen. Experiences, it's, it's travel, it's hospitality, food and beverage. Is that experiences? Yeah. So dining out uh, is a very big part of experiences. Then recreation, you know, concerts, the Taylor Swift phenomena, the you know the ICC Cricket World Cup, just the the spends that we've seen around those mm -hmm. uh, big mega events, festivals like you know we looked at the uh, carnival, let's say in uh, Rio. You know those sort of they are really really getting consumers to spend sometimes over and beyond their means. 
So, you know, there is... What are these spends replacing? What was it that people were spending money on earlier that's now reduced and taken over? So the, so the wallet share of shift, as we call it, has moved away from retail things and especially household goods. Mm. So, you know, when during the 2020, when everybody was locked out, there was this massive spurt in spending on household goods and appliances, electronics, your gadgets, right? Now that has been replaced with going out, okay. eating out, traveling. Uh, do we see that trend coming back to place? Do we see that normalizing? It hasn't happened right now. There is this consumer who is looking to prioritize spending its resources. And it is continuing to spend on the experience economy. And these are my personal views that replacement demand of goods will definitely come back. Like for how long can you just have that one iPhone or that one gadget, right? You will have to replace it. But it is happening at a lagged effect. Hmm. People, that handful of money that people have uh, is still being spent on experiences. Okay, so experiential uh, spending, uh, you've seen it already happen and you're, you're predicting that it's going to continue and amplify in the future. Uh, interestingly, this yeah. is all the things you mentioned is all time time away from my screen. You know, it's it's not look sounding yeah. like I'm purchasing uh, more updated software, spending on technology, buying new hardware, buying a new laptop, mm -hmm. virtual reality headsets. That it, that it doesn't seem like the spend is coming through tech-related hardware or software. It's all away, away, away from screen. So the it is, uh, you know, that, that sort of trend shift is happening. But if the consumer was spending on apparel, on things, on household items, there is this shift in the way it is purchasing things. So, you know, electronic gadgets have become the new wallets. Mm -hmm. Apartments have become the new trial rooms, which means, and as I said, the consumer is looking for cost, choice, convenience. So, you know, you will find everybody looking at their phone screen, purchasing on apps. There, there is a possibility that today I would walk to a Zara store, try something out, and then come back and probably purchase it online, right? So they, you are looking for good deals. You are looking for convenience. There is this, you know, returns, apparel uh, returns have skyrocketed because of just the convenience of somebody coming and pick in, picking it up from your house. Mm -hmm. So there's this entire consumer who is like, I'm not saying that technology, we are in the throes of technology, right? Okay. Our payments are through technology. Our uh, purchases are through technology. To purchasing, so facilitated through life. But you ask yeah. people wanting to move away from their screens, spend time in restaurants, entertainment zones, For sure. concerts, yeah. all that. And, and yeah. you see this yeah. trend continuing in the future. For some time, yes, definitely. I think time. that pent up demand to do things, uh, you know, which we were forced not to do during the pandemic still continues. Okay, great. Okay. So that, that also gives us sort of industries and areas where people could sort of try to position their careers uh, going forward, mm -hmm. sports being obviously another one where they sort of now more actively uh, play sports. Yeah. Then fitness seems to be another one where it's... fitness and wellness to some, like a big extent, right? Like a wellness, just uh, mindfulness. Like these are the things that corporates are also advocating, and consumers or like just people are, are like really, really embracing it. Mm. Like you would, like you know that this entire trend of the work-life balance of sort of giving yourself sanity breaks, that all that has perpetuated post the pandemic, mm. right? right? And I think these are also trends that will continue. Okay, great. Okay, uh, si since we're on the topic of the consumer, you know, Forbes released its uh, list, seem to be like 200 billionaires in India, the highest ever. Um, there's trillionaires coming out of the US. So, you know, you are seeing this divide, um, the wealthy getting wealthier, the poor getting poor. It's been sort of this age-old phenomena. Um, but mm -hmm. there, there is a conversation now saying, hey, but with AI and tech, you might see the middle and lower income rise because they will now have, as you said, productivity gains from increasing technology. And then this chasm might narrow because of technology. Are you a believer in this theory or do you foresee this divide getting wider or do you see it narrowing at any point? AI is a great enabler. Everybody would agree. But it has to be policy-driven. It has to be skill-driven, 
right? Otherwise, what will happen is that, that the educated, the elite, the literate will keep getting access to better technology, improving their lifestyles, improving their income streams. So unless and until there is this entire policy sh driven shift of tech enab enablement across the different uh, tiers of society, there could be a chance that we keep seeing this sort of K-shaped affluent recovery, et cetera, that we have been seeing and it has been continuing. So, and, and this is especially important for emerging markets like that, like to, to embrace or take advantage of this tech boom, it has to be driven from bottoms up. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do think that there is, uh, you know, just because we have technology doesn't mean that it will, mm -hmm. uh, you know, end all uh, evil that we've been seeing in terms okay. of income disparity. Okay. Very nice, very nicely framed. So it's, it's, it's a delicate issue. And if governments and policymakers and citizens at large deploy this mm -hmm. sense of, and sort of from the bottom up, then you could see that effect. Okay, Let, let's talk a little bit about the gig economy. You know, the gig economy mm -hmm. is, is big. The US is talking about it. They're talking about, you know, everyone moving very slowly, but surely towards gig laborers. Do you see this as a global phenomena? Do you see this as a lasting trend where people in their lifespans, they're predicting average uh, human being will work 20 jobs in 20 different companies. So do you, do you predict the sort of gig economy? Is, is that, are you a believer in that? Or, or do you think this is it's just a, a fad and people will end up going back to, to jobs? Anything, according to me, um, as an economist, I feel that at any point in time, the economic factors are defined by an interplay of demand and supply. Hmm. Now, remote work became a norm on the, in, during the pandemic. And this sort of led to this emergence of donut economies. So where we saw this large scale migration away from city centers. Hmm. Do we think that this will continue? We, we're, we're not seeing it. Everybody has back to office mandates. Hmm. You know, they started with two days a week. We are now up to three to four days a week. So that that's, these are not permanent developments, as I were to say, right? Like gig economy is likely to stay, but there is this massive, there is massive demand for workers around restaurants, hotels, travel in line with, you know, the experiences economy that I spoke about. However, we've seen that these workers have been very, very wary of returning to these sectors because of the way they were treated during the pandemic. Mm. And that is why we've seen this entire force of inflation, lack of availability of demand, you know, workers. It's also sort of perpetuated inflation that we've seen. So, you know, it is, and then now we're increasingly seeing normalizing in migration of workers. So people who had gone back home during the pandemic are coming back. So there is this more settlement in the work supply sort of dynamics. So do I think that the future holds where my son, for example, will be working 20 jobs in a day? I'm not sure. I don't think that that trend is very sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think, again, we have to focus on long-term trends. Long-term trends are like structural drivers, which could be aging, population growth, and we need to bolster them with productivity gains to make it sustainable, to make growth sustainable. So yeah, my short answer really is that I don't think, uh, maybe you could have multiple jobs, maybe you could be moonlighting, but definitely there would be a limit to it. Okay, or, or maybe there'll be certain, certain sections of, the, of society that will have mm -hmm. this, like in hospitality or in entertainment, you need to physically be there and that has to be your job, right? Like they need sort yeah. of labor. And then maybe there'll be a section yeah. of society that's sort of, uh, you know, and maybe a larger section than there is today. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Let's let's talk a little bit on uh, sustainability. You know, now based on the conversations we have, there seem to be uh, sustainability seems to be a big theme. Whether it's in fashion, in interior design, in 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 almost every industry, people have touched upon this green and sustainability as a big theme. Uh, mm -hmm. People also talked about sustainability coming at a cost. Because, uh, you know, to manufacture sustainability, the technology isn't advanced yet. So there is all, there's always this cost benefit analysis when it's coming to sustainability. How much are you seeing? Uh, is, is sustainability a fad? Or do you really think this is going to sort of define and underline 
uh, how organizations and consumers behave in the next couple of years. What, what, what are you thinking? I think, I think we will not have a choice. We will be forced as a consumer, as, as organizations to go towards sustainability, to embrace the fact that we are in an environment of climate change, of extreme weather events. And we will become increasingly conscious as consumers to uh, go to companies, purchase from companies that are going through the sustainability route, sometimes willing to pay a premium to it. In fact, I've recently seen posts in LinkedIn, et cetera, where consumers are saying, we don't want to purchase this particular uh, grocery or like vegetables really from an app, online app, because they will, you know, then pack it in, in multiple layers of plastic while the regular vendor on the street will give it to you as is, or you would be carrying your bag to uh, purchase the, those items. So there is this conscious bias. Mm -hmm. There will be a segment of consumers uh, who will be willing to pay a premium. Now, in terms of the percolation of that consumer base, of course, in a country like India, it would be the elite, it would be the upper middle income class who could afford to do that. We cannot expect the lower middle income class to uh, even think about starting to pay a premium as of now. Hmm. They would probably later because unfortunately, emerging markets face the biggest brunt of climate change. Hmm. And it not only impacts lives directly, it impacts livelihoods of the poor the most. Okay. So... I, I believe we will not have a choice. We will have to move as organizations, as consumers towards uh, choosing more sustainable, towards more greener technologies. Okay, the, the problem is, is, is serious. The problem is real and we don't really have a choice as a race to ignore the problem. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, as, as you sit in this in the seat of this, as of an economist, um, what what worries you? What, what, what do you see as sort of, you know, threats uh, for the future, and it doesn't have to be, you know, you cover a APAC, so maybe you can talk from an APAC perspective, a global perspective, if it's different in different regions, wh what are some of the larger threats um, in different in different parts of the world? It could be anything, labor, income, and, you know, what, what's going on? The biggest uh, threat right now, at least in the Asia-Pacific region, is our, or even globally, in fact, our economy is growing more insular and the threat of rising nationalism and geopolitics. And as an economist, supply chains really matter because they are the, they are the ones that lead to comparative advantage, reducing inflation, improving wages, and leading to holistic uh, growth across economies, across markets, across different strata of society. So I think that is one of the biggest risks that I see. Uh, and you're saying supply chain, I'm assuming it's it extends beyond capital goods to also humans um, and the migration of intellectual capital. Yeah, as I, as I had mentioned earlier uh, several times during this interview that uh, the aging population is a very big threat and it is not limited to the developed markets of Japan. Yeah. China is increasingly seeing aging right now. So we are... In, in addition to the aging population, it's also the intellectual capital, right? Like the US employs a lot of people from India and China, like the educated elite, but with yeah. protectionism... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you I, lose I, out on those productivity uh, yeah. gains, which would then lead to secular reduction in things like inflation and improvement and growth, for sure. Okay, <clears throat> so you do you you're seeing that as a as an imposing threat, especially this year. I think four billion people go to poll go to the polls this year. Uh, half the world's population is going to be mm -hmm. at, at the booth. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this what this brings for all of us. Um, and, and and obviously these governments get formulated for the next five years in some cases yeah. repeating terms. So this is sort of fairly long term implication. Okay, let's let's go to the last section of this conversation, which is on skilling. Um, as as somebody who wants to be in the space of, uh, let's say, uh, an economist or somebody in the data science space, somebody broadly that a firm like yours, you know, would hire within your department. Uh, what would you recommend in terms of upskilling and you know, or or just skilling? You know, if someone's in high school and says, "Hey, I want to become an economist," this sounds like a really cool career. What what should they be doing? How should they be thinking? As an economist right now, the immediate need is for data scientists and analytics who understand the econ economics as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that if I if I were to go ahead and hire somebody, I, that would be my biggest. 
criteria in terms of skills. That's the hard skill. That's the hard skill. That's the, the, skill. That's the that's Statistics, like it. data science. Yeah. You know, those, so those, but I do believe that interpersonal skills, flexibility, mindfulness, like those are soft skills which are required even in the future. They have been required. These are, these are skills once you are even hired in an, in an organization for you to sustain, for you to thrive, for you to succeed, sure. you sure. need to keep building on those. Okay. But so, you're, seeing, you're seeing data scientists still, still sort of in the green in the mm -hmm. year to come. Uh, yeah. We also touched upon, you know, uh, behavioral economists and the yeah. understanding of the consumer. So mm -hmm. do you see psychology as a field of the future? Is that, is that a... I think that it's, it's, it could be a great field for the future. I think behavioral economists, economics with psychology, uh, along with some data scientists, uh, statistics thrown in, could be combinations that even five years down the line, we will be looking for to hire. Okay, okay. And you know, you you went to one of the most premium institutes in the world for economics. Uh, but if you had to advise or provide some sort of guidance to educational institutions in terms of their curriculum uh, for the field of economics, what, what would you suggest they either add to the curriculum or remove from the curriculum where you said, hey, a large chunk of my education was this, which I don't really see as necessary as we move forward. I would start it from the schools, especially mm -hmm. the schools in India. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get away from theoretical economics to more practical curriculum because I see my nieces and nephews in the older classes and they're struggling to understand what is it that an economist does in the real world because it is completely not aligned to what they are being taught right now. So I think the change has to begin from there. And then as we grow in college, it has to become more practical. It has to become more, uh, there has to be, Case, it has to be case study based. It has to be driven that the theory remains, but it has to become uh, more uh, practical, more real world. And of course, as an economist, it is not just a, you, you know, you don't have one set of economists or you don't have one type of economist. You could have a bank economist. You could have an academic or you could have somebody working in the development sphere. You could have somebody who's, who's working with the consumer, somebody like me. So you would have to, enhance the curriculum to give those options or at least introduce these various fields within economics to a person who's studying that for them to really understand what they want to do and get the flavor of all aspects of the field okay okay so it sounds like it's more rooted in practicality uh, and and the real world so it's yeah. like fairly theoretical and you yeah. would have liked an introduction to sort of the practical implications and applications of what you were studying in college. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about the curriculum itself? Was there anything in the curriculum you feel like maybe they add more courses on psychology, behavioral, uh, econ economics? Um, was there enough data science taught? Like, how, how is that? What it would probably be, I'm hoping it would be very different, at least in the premium institutions that we are talking about. But definitely a more math, more stats, more analytics should be the focus like it should complement the economic theory as much as it can i think that is something that is required and it will keep increasing and along with with psychology psychology human behavior that sort of behavioral economics as we call it like i think those sort of things would be very very important okay great okay all right terrific anushi Bansal, thank you so much uh, for this conversation right. uh, thank very, you very, very, very all-rounded uh, it seems like you have your pulse on everything. You're an area expert in many, many areas. And thank you for sharing all that expertise with us in this short conversation. All right. Thank you so much, Viba. Thank you. Uh, lo looking forward to your book. Absolutely. Thank you. For that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.